Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. A little bit outside of Tucson, Arizona, is the Titan Missile Museum, which is part of the wider Arizona Aerospace Foundation. Complex 571-7 is a former operational missile site, which was part of the 571st Strategic Missile Squadron, 390th Strategic Missile Wing of Davis Monmouth Air Force Base, Arizona. It is also the sole remaining Titan II ICBM complex of the 54 that were on alert during the Cold War between 1963 and 1987. To my fellow Trekkers out there, you'll know the museum well from its starring role in Star Trek First Contact, where Zephram Cochrane's historic warp ship, the Phoenix, was built and launched from in the movie. Granted, talking Trek lore was not the point of my wife Wendy and me visiting the site. Very kindly, Site manager Mike Riggs came into work early to give us a tour of the silo complex. And the following podcast is Mike taking us through the day-to-day -day life for the four-man Air Force crew that would have kept the site going on 24-hour shifts, the process for launching a missile under the command of my lovely wife, and finally, the Titan II missile itself, N-10. Normally for the Damcasters, I try to clean up the audio as much as I can, but as this is a live tour, our microphone not only picked up Mike's voice as he took us around, but also the subtle changes in ambience as we worked our way around the silo and then out into the Arizona wind. So I've kind of left it as best I can to try to give you that experience of the odd pressure changes and sound changes as we worked our way around. So when we arrived, we were shown a quick introductory video about Complex 571-7. As we walked outside, my first question to Mike as we walked over to the complex proper was how many Titan II sites were there? There was 18 here, 18 around Little Rock, Arkansas, and 18 around Wichita, Kansas, plus four that they built uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base north of Los Angeles out on the coast of California. So that's where all the test launches were done. They never launched a missile from any of the 54 sites uh, Arizona, Kansas, and Arkansas. So all of these were built and that literally never never used even for a test scenario? No, not the ones here, not the ones around Tucson, uh, Wichita, and Little Rock. Those were strictly the alert ones. Uh, the four sites, again, at Vandenberg is where they built everything. So real briefly, we're not going to spend much time up here. This is the main gate over here. So our guys would show up after a briefing up at Tucson, Davis Monthan Air Force Base, that's where the wing yep. commander's post was for all the 18 sites around Tucson. There was two squadrons. So there was the 570, the nine sites kind of north of town, and then the 571 squadron, which were the nine sites, which is, we are at 571-7 mm -hmm. right here today. So they would all attend that briefing, both squadrons, kind of segregated, but not really get everything that they needed, all their food, everything that they're going to need for their 24-hour shift, jump into their truck, drive out here, and show up at the main gate. First of four phone calls is going to be made right there. You notice that little blue box that's right there next to the fence. So during these four phone calls, they're going to be talking exclusively to the guys down in the silo. This is basically shift change, these guys coming in. So they're going to call up and say, hey, we're at the front gate, we're coming in, unlock that gate drive their truck over here, start to unload. Now, the commander of that group, he's got three minutes between the time that first phone call was made that he has to make the second phone call right down here. Bottom of the stairs here, second phone box right here. So. If he didn't make that second phone call within the allotted amount of time, the guys down in the silo, there's no cameras or anything up here. They had no idea what was going on. So back in the day, these sites were out in the middle of nowhere. There was no little town, anything like that. So there was always the possibility that the crews could be infiltrated. They get here to the gate, some guys jump out from behind a cactus with some guns and say, hey, you know, we're going to get in here. So. If they didn't make that, if the commander didn't make that second phone call, the guys down in the silo, that was a security protocol, call up the security detail. 
which was a roaming two guys in a truck that drove between three of these sites during their shift. They were kind of in clusters of three. So they would show up here, M16s out, trying to figure out what the heck is going on. So commander better make sure he makes that phone call in the allotted amount of time. So calls him up, says, guys, I'm at the front door, buzz me in. This door right here had an electronic lock built into it right here. The guy's down in the silo, push a button, and that door would unlock. Commander now, he's the only one that's gonna go through this door. The other three guys gotta wait upstairs here. We do need to mention the watch for rattlesnakes sign <laughs> as we walk in. We. Yeah. That was a stipulation of me coming out was it was going to be in hibernation season. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so commander comes through that door. That door is going to close and lock behind him. This door right here, closed and locked as well with another electronic lock on it. Commander is in what they call the entrapment zone. He's stuck. He can't get back out. He can't get any further down until he reads off a code, a security card that was given to all the commanders that day, alphanumeric numbers on it. So he's going to stand there. He's going to make that third phone call right there. He's going to be talking to those guys, say, OK, I'm ready for the code. Here it is. The guys in the silo now can actually see him, the only television camera on this whole facility. And you'll see the other end of this when we get downstairs is pointed at this landing right here. So they can make sure there's only one person, the commander, in this entrapment zone. Somebody else didn't get in here with him, holding a gun to him, forcing him to read that code off. So he reads the code off, cha-ching, everything is good. But before that door is unlocked and this door is unlocked, our other three guys can come in. See that red coffee can right there? Yep. That code had to be destroyed. They had to watch him destroy that code. So he takes part of that, goes in there, all four guys are now in here. They come on down through. These doors are unlocked. They're going to make their way on down to the blast lock area where okay. the fourth phone call is made. So this is where we're headed now. Down at the bottom of the 55 steps. 55 steps down here, 35 feet underground now. We are at level two. This is the level that we're going to be on that most of the stuff, the big doors and everything is. Now they have this service elevator too. Because obviously there was times they would have to bring the maintenance guys down here. They would have to bring tools. They're going to their ice chest with their food, duffel bag, stuff like that. Make their way down here. Show up right here with the first of these four big blast doors shut right in their face. So we have four of these. This is blast door number six. Blast door number seven you can see right here. These two doors closed up all the time to protect the crew from that pressure wave we talked about. Come screaming in this thing right here big open area, going to amplify that, going to hit this door, 300 PSI, stop dead in its tracks. So this is where the hardened portion of the silo starts right here. Everything past these doors right here, going to withstand that 300 PSI. So that door is what, a foot thick, mm -hmm. made of? Ivy welded together. Each one of these doors weighs 6,000 pounds. That's three tons worth of steel. Because it, it's just a massive rectangular block, isn't it? It's yes. Huge wow. thing. Yeah. And they would seal up, as you can see, the machine surface here, machine surface right here with a little uh, gasket material. So when these doors were shut and pulled tight with this, the mechanism that kept it locked, airtight, nothing going to get through there. So down here. Door shut, obviously they're gonna make that fourth and final phone call from this box right here. Tell the guys sitting at the launch control desk in there, we're at blast door number six, we wanna come in. Gonna to have to push this open button on this panel right here. Now, the trick with this one to get this first door unlocked, the guy sitting at the launch control desk in there, usually the commander was sitting there, he has a button as well that he has to push almost at the same time. So you can't just show up at this door, push the button and get this thing unlocked. It has to take two people. A lot of stuff takes two people here. So they push this open button. What that does is hydraulically activate cylinders inside each one of these big metal boxes right here that will retract these big four inch chromoly steel pins out of the recesses in the door. So there's four pins, pins in like this, 
doors aren't going to go anywhere, right? Pins come out, doors can be opened up. Doors didn't open by themselves. They had to be pulled open manually. Oh, right. So there, there's no extra hydraulics to open in between no. the doors. No. So the stuff you see in the movies are the doors slowly coming. That's not the, not the not four here. guys coming on shift have to yeah. open it, and then the four exactly. guys going out have to then exactly. push it shut. So and out of these four doors, no two of them could ever be open at the same time. These doors had to be closed up at all times. Okay. okay. So they show up here, get that, get that procedure done, open this door. They're going to come on through here. Now they got to close and lock that door back. So now they're in the blast lock right here. Hardened portion of the silo starts right here. Four foot thick walls, five foot thick floors, all encased in steel right here. This is the, the uh, toughest part of the silo in this area right here, designed to withstand that pressure wave because that was the worst thing they were worried about. Big EMP filters. We have these throughout the complex right here to take up that electromagnetic pulse from that bomb going off. Don't want to ruin all of our electronics. Mm -hmm. So that's going to abs absorb that and discharge it straight into the, the ground so that it's not mm -hmm. going to be fed through right. all the piping and what exactly. is inside here. Exactly. So they get inside here. Now they've got to open another door, obviously. All they have to do now is push this button. Okay. They've, the security protocol has been met at this point. So they're in here. Now you start to look around. We're getting into the interior. Check out all the crazy bits, pieces, wirings, hydraulic cables, everything that went into building one of these sites. Where you guys are at today, this site, from very first shovel in the ground until we had a missile in the silo, four guys in there ready to turn the keys to launch it, took place in only 29 months. Wow. All 54 of the sites, plus the four at Vandenberg, were built almost to the day within three years of them starting on this project. Back then, the United States was like thinking the Soviets had all this really cool stuff, a lot more of what they had, because you know, they got into space first, remember? We yeah. were a little bit behind the curve back then, so we were like, oh man, could fear, be bad news. Fear, fear is a great motivator. Right. So not only that, but the vulnerability of those first two ICBMs that we talked about, mm -hmm. that played a big part of this too. Yeah. Because you don't want to lose 80% of your missiles sitting on top of your big, big stick ICBMs with big warheads blown up before you can ever send them back the other way. So that was the theory of, of, of getting these in the ground so quickly, they were like, yeah, we got to get this done. It, it may just be me, but you can kind of feel just walking through as you start getting into the hardened bit. It, it, feels, a, it feels a little bit different. I don't know if that's just my brain thinking I'm now. No, you're, so, you're absolutely, we get a lot of people down here because you're 40 feet basically underground surrounded by tons and tons of steel and concrete. It's it's a different environment. It, it takes a little getting used to. Yeah. So, and the uh, the modern check. Yes, I have no signal. So, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there, there we go. So no no tweeting while you're on duty. Uh, no, not back in the day. Was there ever a security breach here? Not that we're ever been aware of. I'm sure they practiced a few things, but uh, to my knowledge. Uh, I've never heard uh, anybody talk about an actual breach of security. Uh, remember, back in the day, these things were in the middle of nowhere. So mm -hmm. when you walked up on one of these, all you would see is a few phone poles, a big barbed wire fence, and the, the, the silo cover. If you didn't know what it was, you might think it was some kind of a pumping station or something like that. But it was no secret. I mean, when we go back inside, you'll see we have a, a front page of the Tucson newspaper, 1960, with the headline saying, uh, you know, Tucson, where, the, where, the, where these missiles are going to be planted, with a map that shows where they all are. So, you <laughs> so know. It, it, it's an open secret, isn't it? And it's, exactly. And it's as much for reassuring the populace that these things are here for defense in that as it is to show the Soviets, yeah. look, these things. You know, they knew about these. This was the biggest warhead at the time. This was the biggest missile. The United States had the biggest warhead on their stuff. So the Soviets were like, okay, we know you're going to get into a fight with somebody, and you know how hard that person is going to hit you back. 
you're less likely to start something. So deterrence through strength, peace through power, that whole thing. Right. Okay. So 6,000 pound door, been here for 60 years. Let's see how strong you are this morning. <laughs> right. Here we go. So handle. Ah. So it, it's hinged in a way that it's not onerous hmm. to open and shut. Yeah. So that's, that's nice. And it's been Was here it, for 60 it, years. The only thing, only thing that's been done to that, well, once a year, a, a couple of squirts of grease into the hinge block. Wow. These doors were all put all about one quarter of an inch off the ground 60 years ago when this place was built. It, it has not settled a bit. So I guess it's reinforced into the reinforcing as well. So you've got a good cantilever going on exactly. to make sure that it's... Exactly. Because yeah. you want your four, four guys coming in and out to be able to get in and out quickly. Mm -hmm. So yep. you're not spending 20 minutes messing with doors just yeah. in case. Yep. Because that's long enough for something to... Get yeah, you didn't want to spend much time in here. So if you got this door open, you came in here, this door is locked. What happens if all the power goes off? Yep. Now you can't open the door very, very quickly. So you see these holes right here? Those are air holes. <laughs> so if in case you got stuck in here. Now they did have uh, devices right here that you could manually pump those doors open. There's a little device right here. They were little portable hydraulic units that plugged in to these receptacles right here so that you could pump the pins out right. if you needed to. And then the big yellow thing right there, that's the night lock. So that attached to the door right there. So when the guys got done with their, with their tie-in, the other crew left, they would come here. They knew nobody else was coming in. They would install the, the, uh, the night lock or the zombie lock, mm -hmm. if you will. So, so uh, big, big hope that you just a ratchet tight and exactly job done. Because the, the theory behind that was, and somewhere in the program, somebody um, in the security upper echelons of the Air Force came down here, and they had one of these things out here. And they said, hey, guess what? You guys aren't so secure as you thought you were. I can pump those pins open and get that door open. So they came up with this deal. So when that thing was ratcheted tight, even if you pump the pins out, you could not open that door. It's, it's wonderfully simple. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's just a big, big, big hook. Yeah. You're, you're, you're good to go. Yeah. So, so through the doors, here's our other two doors. Now these are the ones that are gonna be closed up to protect us from the missile yep. sitting down the hallway right there. So last door, they're gonna come through here. We're gonna make our way into the launch control center now. So why was the first door you come to, door six? That is something I have never been able to figure out. It's, it does seem a bit um, odd that they would call that blast door six when it's the first blast door. However, Air Force was smarter, yeah, yeah. I suppose, or whatever reason <laughs> they, they had that at the time. Not exactly sure. But anyway... So we're now in the launch control center. This is the middle section, like I talked about, of the three-story part of the silo complex right here. This is where the guys would spend most of their time, right here. Commander would sit here, deputy commander. Our two enlisted guys, our BMAT, our ballistic missile analyst technician is going to be responsible for the missile, this stuff right here. Our other enlisted guy, our missile facilities technician, is going to be in charge of these panels right here. Commander's job was basically tell you what to do. Management. Yeah. Okay. Position. He even gets the ashtray right here. Well, I, I, I'm noticing that the, the officers get chairs and the enlisted men get Don't. a bench. Yeah. At best. No, that bench was oh, not the... there. That was put in for, for, for that, <laughs> so uh, for the tours. Deputy Commander, he's got quite a bit of work to do. He's in charge of all the radios. Um, all that good stuff, keeping track of the clock here. His uh, other uh, very important job was to maintain this locator board right here. So when they were down here, they had to keep track of where everybody was at all times. Now, just these four guys, that's pretty easy to do. But you can see now how complex this whole thing is. Maintenance was a huge aspect of this. They had a complete different wing of maintenance guys, the MIMS, 
that were responsible for keeping this place up and running. These four guys' job was to launch the missile. That's basically their their whole world revolves around getting this missile launched. So, so they're not also doing general maintenance tasks. They're just here ready to go in case. Right. They're the checking happens. things yeah. out. They're making sure everything is is up and running. If they see a problem, they're going to call the maintenance guys up and come down here. So there's potential. You could have 10 people down in here. Guys working down in the silo, deputy commander right here with this grease board had to keep track of who was where, all eight levels of the silo right here. Very important thing, because you didn't want to miss somebody, have somebody down there that you didn't know where they were. You had an accident or you got the signal to launch. Believe me, those guys were going to hightail it back in here very quickly. Yeah. So would they, would they be sort of uh, calling in as they move through each of the compartments or? Depending on what was going on, and as if you notice, we have these headsets here. Uh, they can, uh, the maintenance guys, there's, there's places to plug those headsets in all up and down, outside as well as inside. So when they were doing work, they could have a direct line uh, to the commander, to the guys in here. They had to talk about what was going on as well. Later on, they had walkie-talkies mm -hmm. that they would just carry those around with them uh, if they needed to yeah. instead of hardwiring in like that. So guys show up here, tie in with the crew that's here, okay? So the crew that's here, they've been here for 24 hours. They've maintained all of this, made sure that everything is up and running. There's no maintenance squawks, anything like that. Tie-in is going to ensure that the crew coming in knows everything about what's going on here. So the commander and the deputy commander, the two officers, 20-year guys, okay, they have each been assigned a combination lock. They're the only person on the planet that knows the combination to their lock. This is where we get into the two-man policy. You're going to see that a lot. They're going to come in here, do the start of that tie-in. The commander and deputy commander that are here going to exchange pleasantries with the guys coming in, which they probably know and everything. Hey, how's it going, all this? Okay, first order of business. The guys that are here, commander and deputy commander, are going to take their locks off this big red safe right here. This was the EWO safe, EWO, emergency war order. This is where all the codes are kept, along with a, a very, very top secret book called the PSYOPs book that we'll get to in a minute. So. Take their locks off. They're going to open this up. Commander and deputy commander coming in. They're going to come over here, look in this safe, and make sure everything that's supposed to be in there is in there, sealed up, just like it's supposed to be. So they do that on the, on the starter shift? Yes. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it looks just like a massive reinforced filing cap. Yes, it's very, very yeah. heavy. So guys coming in, make sure everything's in there. They're going to put their locks on there and lock that up. So if we have two locks, what does that tell us? Two men. Exactly. Yeah. One person cannot get access to all the secret stuff inside this safe. So all good. Everything else is hunky-dory. Those guys are going to leave, go back through those doors, up the stairs, jump into that truck that we came out here in, head on back to Tucson. We're, here, we're now here for the remainder of our ship. So, which one of you wants to be the commander and which one of you wants to be the deputy well, commander? I think, I th yeah, I think we know who the commander in this relationship is. So have a seat. You're going to sit over here, the deputy commander's chair. Ugh. So while you're here on your 24-hour shift, actually 23 hours now after mm -hmm. that, that tie-in is done. Just, just out of interest, what would the handover be be between the two crews? Would it be very much over to you and then they head out or is there, is there a checklist that they would run through they, or? Would, they had a checklist that they would run through out of the dash one manual right mm -hmm. here just basically making sure they would go through everything and say okay this radio is working this is working the way it's supposed to be we've got power to the missile the the, the warheads whatever everything the warhead is already preset everything is working good we've got no squawks we got no lights that are telling us there's something wrong no fuel leaks anything like that so once that's done i mean it could take longer than two hours to get that done right. it could be all the way up to four hours depending on what was going on the two enlisted guys they're going to be going downstairs with the two enlisted guys they're going to be checking things there's valves and stuff down there down level eight you guys will get to see mm -hmm. the pumping rooms 
looking for leaks, stuff like that, making sure everything is up and running. So every 12 hours, they had to do a complete systems check. They did it at tie-in, 12 hours into their shift, had to be done again. So that's what they were doing for the most part. Now, when they weren't busy, what were they doing? Waiting. Waiting, having a smoke break, stuff like that. So while they were here, one very important thing, and we're going to go back to that two-man policy thing. While you guys are here, the four of you, in this room right here, upstairs, as we came in, right here on the end of this big panel, there's a big sign, a rule that has to be followed very, very closely at all times. It says, two-man policy mandatory, no loan zone. So that meant there had to be two people in this room at all times. One of them had to be either the commander or the deputy commander. You two guys could not go upstairs, have dinner, take a nap by yourselves, and leave the two enlisted guys down here by themselves. Commander, you want to go upstairs? Deputy commander, you're going to assume that seat. I'm going to take your seat right here. The enlisted guys had a small part to play in when the signal was received. They could copy down code, but they could not get into the safe if that alert went off. when commander was upstairs, he would very quickly have to come back down here. So they could receive it, they couldn't verify it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, aside from that, what we're going to talk about right now is a scenario. These things were online from 1964 all the way up until 1982. So during that time, height of the Cold War, a lot of tension between us and the United S or Soviet Union, right? So ask yourself a question. What would have to happen for Strategic Air Command to get on the radio and send you guys a message to launch this missile? So they've noticed a launch. Exactly. We would have to be under attack. Remember, United States' doctrine since World War II is that we would never again use nuclear weapons as a first strike. So we're going to have to be under attack. Back in the day, it was the only country capable of waging all-out nuclear war, former Soviet Union. So we're going to say, the guys over there at the Kremlin have decided today is the day we think we can win World War III. We're going to launch our missiles against the United States. They're going to launch perhaps 100 of their biggest and best ICBMs at us. You guys have absolutely no idea what's going on right now. Those missiles, as they leave their launch sites in the Soviet Union, it is a 30-minute flight time to get over here. I've spent more time at the DMV than it takes for a Soviet missile to come over here and ruin our day. Not long at all. Those missiles are going to start to climb up 800 miles up above the Earth on their journey over the North Pole to get to us here. Okay, so we had guys at a place called Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, NORAD, North American Air Command. You guys have heard of that place, right? It's been in the news. A yeah, little bit recently. A bit more. Yeah. <laughs> For other reasons, but we won't go into right now. But that place was manned, huge underground facility under that big mountain outside uh, Colorado Springs, 24 7. Guys sitting in there watching these big screens that were hooked up to two different systems. First one was called the Dew Line, distant early warning. The other one was the Bemuse, the ballistic missile early warning system. Radar stations that we had built up in Canada, Alaska. Greenland and in the UK pointed back over the North Pole to look for those Soviet missiles headed our way. So the guys there at NORAD see that and they say, oh, expletive. Looks like the Soviets have started World War III. What are they going to do? Pick up that red phone and call who? The president. The president. Only person that can authorize the use of our nuclear forces. Sir, we have inbound missiles confirmed from the Soviet Union. What are we going to do? The president says, we got to retaliate, so he hangs up that phone immediately tells the people around him, his handlers, to get me the football. You guys know what that is. It's a briefcase the president has very close to him at all times to this day that contains the launch codes for our silo-based missiles, our bomber forces, as well as our submarines that can launch intermediate-range ICBMs as well. So he's going to get those. It takes two people now to get into that to validate those codes. After that's done, He's got to quickly get a hold of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. They, in turn, would have gotten a hold of Strategic Air Command. 
who was in charge of these things. Later on, it was Tactical Air Command. They were located off at Air Force Base, Omaha, Nebraska, in a big underground facility, four stories underground, that had the ability to send the launch messages out simultaneously to all our nuclear forces, our silo-based missiles, our bomber forces, as well as our nuclear submarines. So, you guys, having a great day down here, thinking about whatever, Saturday night. This is what you're going to hear. So you have these books in front of you. As soon as this gets done. You guys are sitting here? You have these books in front of you at all time. Emergency action message books. Open to this front page. All right? So, anytime a message comes through that radio like that, it's going to be in code. Nobody's ever going to get on the other end and call you guys up and say, yeah, we're under attack. Time to launch the missile. Not going to happen. Everything was in code. So, aside from sitting here doing this, you're going to be listening very intently for messages coming through the radio because you've got to decipher them and figure out what it is. So, what we just heard was a small portion of what would have been a 41-character message that these guys had to listen to, right? And they're not going to repeat it. So you guys will be on, on your A game right now, writing that stuff down. Okay. So this was the launch order. We're going to find out. You now have three minutes to get this missile in the air. So very quickly, copy that message down. As soon as you guys are done, you're going to swap books because you, commander and deputy commander, have to agree, right, that this is the launch order or we're going to find out that it's the launch order. So you swap books. So commander gives deputy commander her book. Deputy commander looks at commander's book and says, uh, sir, number eight, I believe was an H. Commander says, well, no, I think he said A. So now what? <laughs> well, fortunately, the Air Force knew their speakers were not quite up to par. So anytime a message started come through the radio like that, it would automatically print out on our little dot matrix printer right here so you could just pop that out right there, show that commander and say, see, I told you that's what it was. So, so you've got a bit of redundancy built a in. A bit of well. redundancy okay. built in. You both have to agree. What's the next step? Get into the safe. Okay, going to unlock that safe. Inside that safe, we're going to look for a file in there that contained about 30 of these things right here. These were what we call the cookie cards. Okay. There's a number of them in there, 30 of them, maybe, more, less. How do we know which of these cards to pull out? Each of these cards has a two characters on the front. Here's another one right here. You can see letter, number, two letters, stuff like that. How do we know which card we need for today? Well, it came in that message, the preamble. Message follows. The very first two characters on that recording, that's the card. That's the key to knowing which one of those cards we need. So we're going to pull that out. They call these cookie cards because they were in hard plastic. And just like a fortune cookie, you had to break it open to get the cookie out. This is what the cookie looked like right here. Make sure first two characters on the cookie match the characters on the outside of the card. We're all good. So what's the big deal about this thing right here? Two bits of coding right here. That's going to match up to a book that was in that safe, the most top secret piece of information here was called the PSYOPS book, Single Integrated Operational Plan. That book was drawn up by the guys at the Pentagon, sat around, big table, days and nights, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, figuring out all the different ways that the United States might get into a war with the Soviet Union. Lots of different scenarios. World War III could not have started like what we're talking about right now. It could have been a limited conflict, okay? This is basically now going to tell you guys what battle we're fighting today, okay? So you guys know now what's going on. So now you're starting to, if you weren't excited, you're going to be now. So you have a little bit of awareness. You've got of a what's, little bit of knowing what's yeah. going on. This so whether is it's all hands on yeah. deck, you know what's going to be going on. Yeah. Everybody is like spooled up. So got that done. While we're in the safe, you guys are going to grab the keys. Whoever's in there. Commander, 
This is your key to the automated launch control panel, Deputy Commander. You have a key that goes in over here on your panel. It's over seven feet apart. Back to the two-person thing. One person can't turn both of those keys. Both of those keys had to be turned within two seconds of each other, held for five seconds to start the automated launch sequence. That's how we launched our missile, okay? Probably seen movies where you push a big red button to launch the missile, and that doesn't happen in the Air Force. You just turn the key. Exactly. That turned both of those keys at the same time. So, we got that done. Now, what time are we actually going to launch our missile? This becomes very important because remember, we have 54 of these things scattered across the country. Everybody on those other missile bases has gotten that message at the same time you guys did, done exactly what we've done. Everybody knows what the deal is, puts their keys in, turns the keys and launch their missiles, right? No, because you don't want them all. What would happen if we launched them all about the same time? You increase your chances of things crossing and hitting exactly. on the way. They're going to hit each other, possibly. This whole herd of these things headed back over the North Pole to Russia, so they were all staggered. For the missile wing around here, the two squadrons, in those messages was predetermined. They had a delay time. So based on what came through on that coding, it was either plus five minutes, plus three minutes, or as soon as you got everything figured out, you launched your missile. Okay? That kept the missiles coming out of the silos between three and five minutes apart. It kept them spaced out so they didn't run into each other didn't want a whole herd of these things all converging, going back over, might knock our bombers out of the sky too, who are now off on their mission to bomb the Soviet Union. So it's essentially a, a creeping barrage. Yeah. You're, you're having things landing at different times at different places exactly. so that you're keeping, keeping now, now if there's anybody left, they don't have as much chance to. Right, so what we're talking about here is all out retaliation. Chances are, would they have launched all of them at the once? Who knows? They may have kept some of them back, see what was going on, see how bad it was, see how many Russian missiles actually impacted the United States and made a determination from there. Or it could have been like, yep, we know, this is it. Everybody launched their missiles. Now remember, out of these 54, there's never going to be all 54 of them online at the same time. There's going to be maintenance issues. I don't know what the percentage was of what they figured it would take if it was an all-out launch of these things, nine megaton, nine million tons of TNT in each one of these warheads. So. It's utterly terrifying. Yeah. Really, isn't it? And you've yeah. got two guys here following a playbook, knowing that as soon as they finish what they do, if they get out, yeah. there's nothing really to get out to, right. potentially. Because World War Three, remember, 30 minutes. 30 minutes the other way, into the world, a little over an hour. <laughs> Crazy stuff. All right, so back to what you guys are going to have to do. Now, right. what time are we actually world. going to launch our missile? We just got that message. This is our local time right here, 24-hour clock. Deputy Commander, you have a clock over here that's set seven hours ahead of our local time. Where do you think that is? Zulu, that's exactly. back Great home. Time, yeah. Where all the time zone starts. So it doesn't matter if you're here in Tucson, if you're in Wichita, Kansas, or in your Little Rock, Arkansas, if you have your clock set to Zulu time, guess what? It's the same time for everybody. Nobody got to figure out, well, let's see, is it daylight savings time? What time zone are we in? We got three minutes to launch this missile. So very quickly, you're going to discern that. Write your launch key, your turn key time across the face of that clock right there. We now have just about everything we need final piece of the puzzle revolves around this thing right here. So remember we talked about our Titan II being fully fueled up all time, sitting down there in the silo, did not have to be raised to the surface and put the oxidizer in the fuel tanks. Titan II used what was called hypergolic propellants. That word hypergolic means that when the fuel and the oxidizer, when those two chemicals come in contact with each other, they ignite. You don't need a spark, you don't need a fuse, anything like that. So, out on our missile, two big first stage rocket engines on the lines from the fuel and oxidizer tanks, we had installed these valves. These were called butterfly valves. Very simple, open, close. This is an actual one of them that's been cut in half so you guys can see how it worked. Now, 
valve had a very, very top secret locking mechanism on it, okay? That had to be unlocked with a code that goes into this panel right here, butterfly valve lock, okay? Safety, security. Too easy to launch one of these things, they figured out. What happens if stray signal, those valves opened up? Now you're, yeah, you're in a world of trouble. So, six thumb wheels, 16 characters on each wheel. That's about 17 million different combinations. Worst case scenario, somebody actually does get down here. You've got a crew that goes rogue or something like that. They don't get into the, to the safe. They think, we can start World War III by ourselves, start putting codes in here. There's only one that's going to work, and it's going to come out of that cookie card or that message right there. This had a safety feature built into it. If you put the wrong code into this thing, after the sixth try, it would completely disable this panel. Okay, couldn't unlock the valves. Only person that could make this thing work again was one of the maintenance guys that was sent down by the wing commander. And that's not going to happen in three minutes, right? So, for whatever reason, you guys now got to this point and you realize, uh-oh, something's wrong. We can't remember what it was. We're very confused at this moment. Put different codes in that thing. It gets locked up. What are you going to do? Panic. Panic. Commander tells Deputy Commander, go get a big hammer, run down to level eight, and knock those locks off that valve so we can launch our missile. They had an explosive charge built into it, a tamper-proof thing, so that if you tried to mess with those locks, it would jam this valve shut tight. Missile is not going anywhere. You now have a 330,000-pound paperweight sitting out there in the silo. So this is where constant training Exactly. Constant preparation, exactly. constant readiness is coming in so that... These guys would be doing this in their sleep. They had done this so many times. They had two rooms like this up at the wing commander's post, training simulators. Those guys would go in there, be some, they would get a message, they would go through this, something would happen, something wouldn't work right. They would have to stay there, figure it out. Why the missile, why can't we make it go? And of course... They're all doing it under the clock. It's everything's been exactly tested, trained, exactly. trained. Th lots of different things thrown at them, which they have to jump on because of that 30-minute window. Yeah, that's it. And by the time, that's the other thing. I mean, well, I guess it's not 30 minutes for them because you've already had the initial process going through NORAD, right. the president SAG. Yeah. Oh, oh goodness. So that could all be. You don't. I mean, what we just talked about was a you know, timed out event. It could take 15 minutes for NORAD to actually figure out, okay, this is, it's not a false alarm. These missiles are now even closer than they were 15 minutes ago. So you got to get a hold of the president, Joint Chiefs of Staff, all that stuff, get a hold of SAC. Time is of the essence. That's why they wanted something that they could get in the air very, very quickly, because even if those Soviet missiles were no more than 10 minutes away, from starting to impact their targets here, they knew they could get these away. And the Soviets knew it as well. So the chances of them actually thinking they could win World War III once these missiles were in the ground was they would have to have been like roll the dice yeah. type of thing. It wouldn't work. So anyway, moment of truth. Now you guys have got to launch the missile, all right? so. Are you ready to see what happens? So put your hands on your keys. Oh, I can, I can, I can slide over. Oh, can I? Uh, now, oh, oh, walk. Okay. Right. There you go. All right. So, Commander, you're going to give us a nice three, two, one, mark on mark. You both are going to turn those keys to the right, and you're going to hold them for a few seconds until our launch enable light comes on. As soon as that happens, you can release the keys. You come back around here because I'm going to explain what's going to happen very, very quickly once those keys are turned. So, Commander, at your discretion. Is it 321 or 123? <laughs> <laughs> You're the commander, you choose. 3, 2, 1. All right, we have our launch enable light. You can let go. Very quickly now, next light that comes on, batteries activated. Out on the missile, there are two batteries that have to be charged up. The missile's guidance system is going to need some electrical power once it leaves the silo to find its way to the Soviet Union. It takes 28 seconds for those batteries to come online. Electrolyte is being forced into them for the very first time. 
28 seconds later, we're going to get our APS, auxiliary power supply, meaning now the missile will be operating on its own internal power. We lose all electrical power from the grid. Guess what? That missile is still going to go. APS power going to be followed by silo saw, and that very loud cell is telling us that 760 ton steel and concrete silo closure door is starting to open up. It takes 20 seconds for that door to fully open up, get out of the way of the missile. We're going to get a final guidance go check with the missile's computer. Missile says, I'm ready to go. Engines have just fired. About five seconds later, the missile starts to leave the silo. 58 seconds after those keys are turned, that missile is on its way. Once those keys are turned, there is no more communicating with the missile. There is no abort switch. There is no shooting that missile down. You guys will never know if it actually hit its intended target 30 minutes later. So it's, that's it. That's it. And there's nothing more that's expected of the crew that's in this silo. Well, now what are we going to do? Get out. Well, now hold on. So if we're down here, before we launch, we feel the ground shake. That means there's a bomb went off somewhere close, right? So that, what's yeah. the side effect of a nuclear radiation? Bomb? Right. So nobody's going to be chomping at the bit to run upstairs and see what's going on. So they had 30 days of food and water. They can stay down here, hang out, see what's going on. They had a lot of radios antennas stored down in the ground they could possibly get out yeah. at some point but that's it that's all it took and i guess that's where the, the nightmares start because you have no idea what's unless you're getting signals through you don't know what's yeah what's happening you may never hear from anybody else again after 30 days you were on your own so commander deputy commander Thank you for your help today. Good job. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you, th you think of all the steps, all the, the checks, the balances and things, and yet it comes down to a few simple yeah. moments and that's it. And all of this is for potentially one moment. Right. Yeah. All of the expense, all of the, the waiting. And right. It just comes out to that. So in one aspect, you can think of the Titan II as a, a weapon of last resort. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you had got that signal, World War III was possibly well underway. It's just, I mean, they it would have. Different targets, still the different yes, missiles. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the missile was programmed with three separate targets. Okay. So there's target one. I don't know if yeah, you saw, saw over that, here. Yeah. Over here like that. That was all pre-programmed. Put into the missile's guidance computer with this Mylar punch tape right here. Guys from the Pentagon, the war planners, whoever up in the upper echelons, you guys would have no idea where this missile was going to go. That is one thing that is still classified today as where these missiles were aimed at. They especially didn't want to tell the crews because what if you had relatives yeah. somewhere and said, no, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hesitate. Hesitate, Soviets might actually have a missile that's going to hit this place dead on, and you're not going to be able to get your missile in the air. Will they ever be released the details of the, where the targets were? No. I doubt it. Secret stuff. Mm -hmm. Especially not now. No. <laughs> So as we so, walk down this cableway, so remember, this is the hardened portion of the silo right here. Nothing's going to really get into this except a direct hit. So as we go down this cableway now, all the communication, everything that operates the silo basically runs down this tube right here. All the missile wiring are on these banks over here. All the electrical is up above our heads. The water is over here. These are all springs inside here that support this upside down U. So this whole thing, the floor is not going to move, but all the other stuff that's supported on here is going to be able to move up and down side to side. You can see how they left slack yeah. in the lines right here. So if there's any shock, you're not going to have any ruptures on your cables exactly. going through. Exactly. Exactly. And all by the Core Fund Company of Westbury, New York. Yep. There was a lot of subcontractors that built a lot of the stuff for these silos. 
But one the thing you have to understand is that these, these things were all built on site. If you look, you can actually see there, it was raw stock, all welded, all cut, all bolted together. Um, just amazing what they were able to do in such a short amount of time. So here's one view of the missile right here. Again, we're on level two. This section right here is where the, the guidance bay was in this section right in here. You can look up, you can look down. I know it's, it's hard, you're gonna be able to see a little bit. You, um, I get a different perspective here in just a minute, but I know you can't see all of it, but the missile itself is 103 feet tall from tip to tail, 10 foot in diameter, would have weighed 330,000 pounds, fully fueled up with a warhead, ready to go in three minutes if everything was, was happening the way it should be. And of course, no window here. No window Prior to here. that. Yeah. No window here. This was all put in so that um, you folks can actually see the missile in the silo. The only other place would be to see through that door right there, which gives you not a very good view. And would it have been plain metal as it's here, or would it have been? This is just the way it would yeah. have looked. I have this odd idea that they would be painted. They're painted white, or was that just? Well, there are. If you look, you'll be able to see when we go down. You, there is a portion of it that actually does have white and black paint on it. But other than that, we've just got the stencil and we've got that U.S. Air Force down the side and right. all the all the different access panel labels. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we've, and I guess you've got, those are maintenance gantries as well that sort of yes, fold, the, fold up. Yes, the and maintenance in. platforms, as you can see, that go all the way around the missile from level one down to level five. Uh, those could all be let down so the maintenance crews could get out. There was doors on each one of the levels that they could get out there, perform maintenance on the missile, uh, which, you know, that was a big part of this, obviously. Yeah. And it's, I guess it's, it's maintenance on a, on a routine, isn't it? It's, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's Tuesday, we're, we're checking these bits. It's Wednesday, you're checking these. It's whatever times things come up or if an error and, comes up when the it, system's checked. It's like a... Uh, you can relate to this like a, like an airplane. You have what's called TLMC, time yeah. limit maintenance checks. So obviously this thing is going nowhere, but even sitting there, just as with an aircraft, there are a certain amount of time, uh, 18 months or whatever, dictates that you get inside that thing and check this out, make sure that this is, you know, this there's no corrosion uh, on a valve or something like that. Very, very detailed uh, maintenance schedules that were performed on these things to make sure that they could be launched, you know, when the time came. And it's, I guess it's, it's powered up to a degree. So if something should fail, it can tell the guys in exactly in the control room that something has failed right. and the maintenance guys can come out and swap it out. Yep. Exactly. It's very odd standing here, looking at it, knowing what it is. It's, yeah, it's not, it, to be fair, it's not something the likes of you and I were ever supposed to see, but it's, but it's, it's the, you know, all of this, you know, it's there, it's, it's in the back of our minds uh, of, you know, what might happen, what, what do we, what would that look like? It's, you know, prior to things that have happened recently, that that's kind of been on the back burner of everybody's consciousness, I guess, to think that uh, since, uh, you know, the Cold War ended, there was more of a like, well, we're never going to be able to, you know, this is something that's just not going to happen. But uh, back in the day, that was, I mean, this was paramount. I mean, this was absolute. Spend the money, put the system in the ground, make sure that we have the, the, uh, the ability to counteract anything that the Soviets could throw at us. It's terrifyingly impressive. <laughs> I think that's, that's the only, only way to put it. And again, it, there's something industrial as well about it that it, it, it just seems to be, I'm trying to find the word because it's, it's very odd being here. It's, yeah. it's, it's a really interesting experience. 
because you know, growing up into the eighties, it wasn't too bad, but it was it, it was always in the back of back of the mind that something could happen, especially with yeah, movies and books still coming up, scaring the crap out of everybody. Right. But it's uh, it's there. Now. If you're feeling brave. Oh, of course. We're going to get to see something that most people don't get to see. Ooh. ladders that went between all of the floors so uh, there was several different ways to get out or at least get to from one level to another without having to jump in the elevator so you've got all those redundancies built in you're basically should anything fail there's fallbacks for you to be able to guess around to make sure that you're in a position to launch should the call come exactly and as much as we like to think that things don't break it is, oh, it is, yeah. it is a government contract. So we're now at level seven. There's one level below us that the elevator goes to and one level below that, which is a big sump where water would collect anything like this. So it feels weird doing here. This is the bottom of the missile right here. So walk through and have a look up. Wait till you come in here, then you feel even weirder. It's the pressure. Yeah, yeah. it's pressure. Yeah. It's... Holy cow. Okay, <laughs> so we are right at the bottom looking 103 feet. Three feet straight up. It is, yes, it's huge. And so this is where the, the engines would be installed. Now, obviously, the engines are the engines are outside. And so the, our, if you come see the museum, you're not going to be able to come down here. You're going to be able to see the engines. So they would hang down. Now, these platforms that we're on right here would have been retracted. You can see all the way down now to the very, very bottom, level 8. This is where the flame deflector is. So our two big engines would hang down here. Those engines would ignite. The thrust of each of those would hit that 20 foot high concrete piece, be turned right around and shot straight up 150 feet up to the surface. So that comes out either side of the silo. When the door yeah. is open, it exposes two big grates. That's where that would come out. This is terrible for a podcast host when I literally lost for words because it's just insanely massive engineering. Right. Well, check this out. All oh, right. Okay. So the missile, 330,000 pounds, is all resting on the launch ring right here. Okay. The only thing holding the missile in the silo is the weight of the missile and four big explosive bolts on these little pieces right here. Okay? Oh, man. So the launch ring, as you can see, check this out. Look up. You see those 22 foot high springs right there? Yep. This whole missile can sit here and bounce a little bit. We get that pressure wave through here. Big hydraulic rams right here could be pressurized right before the engines ignite. Obviously, we don't want the missile doing this mm. when the things ignite. So the engines would ignite, come up to 77% of power. That would trigger the bolts exploding. A few seconds later, we have full power, 450,000 pounds of thrust pushing that missile out of the silo. So just to describe this, dear listener, it is basically a massive steel donut held together four things. And when we say small pins, they're only inch and a half diameter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's... This is one place you would not want to be standing when the missile took off. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Nowhere in here. And you're not really, so you've got essentially a gimbal keeping it as level as possible with that amount of thrust being generated, right. vibration through it. Because right. you've only got... Gyroscopes keeping the missile, yep. yeah. And you've only got what? 
tolerance of what's that about 12 ten, feet 10 feet yeah. between the sides so it has to be pretty accurate but now here's here's another part of the thing that you need to think about guys have seen a rocket launch been to a rocket launch on television mm -hmm. right you know when the engines ignite what happens deafening loud so loud makes the ground shake 450,000 pounds of thrust within four seconds think about that so the engineers had to come up with a way to keep this thing from shaking itself to bits for the few seconds that it came up out of the silo. So, as you look down here, check out these big nozzles. You see these one, see right here? Yep. There's one here, one here, one over here, one over here. Over on the other side of the silo, we had a 100,000 gallon water tank buried in the side of the silo. About a minute, before the engines ignite, water starts gushing out of these pipes right here. It starts to fill that up with water down there. So, in a matter of a few seconds, you have 450,000 pounds of thrust. Now, think about it. It's not the heat, but the kinetic energy, the force of that thrust hitting that water would do what? Vaporize it. Would turn it into steam. Yeah. So, steam you can think of as basically um, hot fog. You know how when it's very, very foggy out, how thick and wet the air is? Yep. That steam cloud generated would actually act like a gigantic muffler. It would absorb a lot of that noise and vibration for the few seconds that everything clicked, full power, the missile starts to leave the silo. It's not going to take very long. All around here, these are all full of fiberglass insulation, so that helped a little bit as well. But had that not gone off, the, the, the missile would have just shook itself to bits. So it's it's just creating a dampening effect to just help it exactly on that initial 100, right. 100 foot journey. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you see the pictures of missile coming out of the silo and you see these two big plumes of stuff coming out, that's that steam cloud being blown out. The science behind it is just mind blowing and it's it's the logical steps in it. It's not just, okay, we need a rocket that can essentially shoot out of a hole in the ground. It's how do we get it out safely in a way that it can then complete, exactly. its, complete and, its journey. And, and this is all being done back in the late 50s, early 60s. Slide rules and... Exactly. That's yeah. one of the things you talk about is, okay, you think about building this place. You think about sitting there designing that. What did those guys not have that we have today that makes that... CAD computer. Yeah. They were all using slide rules and T squares. See, that would make my father happy because he's 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 a he's an architect and he's still got his board and paper. And yeah. Yeah. That 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 would make him very very. It's I. The engineering is incredible. There's also something rather rudimentary about it as well. It's just enough, isn't mm -hmm. it? it? It's not. Oh yeah. It yeah. Scott showing a slingshotty effect of behind your shoulder. It is exactly, exactly that. It's it's just what it needs to be. Because yeah, I think this is where movies have led us astray. Because sometimes you see these things and they're beautifully, yeah, you know, stainless steel and and they look great on camera. But in reality, it's just to serve that one purpose for that one moment that really you hope never comes. That's why. They thankfully, call it, it never did. When that's why they call it hardware. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it, it's all inspiring. It really is in, in the truest sense of. It's the, massive. Yeah. I mean, the whole, uh, take away the missile. Then you have this, I mean, just take away bits and pieces of it and yeah. see what you have. I mean, every piece is just uh, the engineering and the way they had to figure all this out. Uh, I mean, you know, it was the infancy of the space age. I mean, yeah. rockets were, you know, that was, this is new stuff, you know? Yeah, and, uh, you, know, you know, the the ballistic missile is only 20 years old by this point, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, Well, not even that. So if this is being designed in the 50s, you're talking... Late 50s, early, 10, early. 10, 10 years yeah. since the V2 proved that it could, it could yeah. be done. Massive steps. I yeah. mean, they were, things were just happening so fast. It was just, you know, once the wheel started turning, it was going downhill and mm. it just kept picking up speed. I'm going to attempt... We'll, we'll put pictures up for this just to describe what it's feeling like because it's it, you can feel it in your your ears the sort of the closeness of it and looking up dear listener is 
It's a privilege to be down here because that is, if you've ever been to, say, Canaveral or, or Houston and you've seen the rockets standing there, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one thing when they're out in the open. And looking up to the lovely glass ceiling we have here with the clouds <laughs> dancing on it, but seeing it in the silo in a way that the likes of me were never intended to see it. it right. It, it's an odd feeling. It, and, and this is one of... Many, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, you see this in its singularity, but you think of there are 18 of these mm. right in this area, you know, around Tucson, and it just becomes, yeah, insane. Well, this, is, this has really been something. Thank you so much, yeah. Mike and Scott. And I guess let's head up and have a look at the engine. Yeah, we can head back upstairs. Cool. First and foremost was our communications. Like we talked about inside, very, very important. Primary communication antenna, metal antenna outside the fence there. Our other antenna out here in the parking lot, that funny looking Christmas tree shaped thing. High frequency, short wave, yep. worldwide communications with that. You can see basically that neither one of those is gonna withstand that pressure wave that we talked about. They're gonna be knocked flat. Yep. So they had backup antennas the white one you can see sticking up out of the ground, hardened 80-foot silos. Those antennas could be popped up. So you've got full redundancy there in case anything exactly. happens with, with the main ones. Right. So you got to see the missile in the silo from two different perspectives. I told you it was 103 feet tall. This pole right here with the crow's nest stands right at 55 feet. So the missile is twice as tall as that. The silo is three times as deep as that pole right there. <laughs> Just a better perspective. There's something about the pole being out on its own and not sort of encased. It sort of feels just as tall. It, yeah. It's an odd bit of perspective. Right. So that's then, the silo closure door. That's the 760 ton steel and concrete thing that would raise up and then slide back in 20 seconds, so the missile could actually leave the silo. Quite a piece of engineering that was, to be able to weld all that steel to be precise enough that it did not warp was monumental in the art of steel construction. And then be able to have that weight and slide. How often was the silo open to test? Maybe things? once a year. That was it. The, because of the weight and the mechanism, they did not want to open and close it all the time uh, because uh, there was really no way to change, <laughs> uh, work on it once it was uh, open and closed. So that was something that was kept to a minimum. So again, now you're going to be able to look down and see the missile in the silo all the way down 150 feet. Oh, I don't like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's easier looking up for someone like me than it is looking down. Oh dear. So you've got half the blast door there so that you've got the, the viewing platform to, to look down on it. And orientating myself, the the out outflows for the the boost would have been there? They would have been covered up. Yeah. The the exhaust ports? Yeah. yeah. So they are actually under uh, oh, they're under the, under the glass. Somewhere it, right in here, they've been partially covered up. When the door was all the way open, it would expose the two big exhaust vents. Oh, of course, because they wouldn't want to be exposed the rest of the time. Anyways. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. The whole door would come and fit right here. Yeah. So that's yeah, that is that is a hefty bit of hefty bit of steel. That's three inches by. Fine line. What do you reckon? Three? Yeah, about that. So one six and a half centimeters for my listeners back in. A, the, I know you don't like to look down, but come over you, here. You're going to make me do it, aren't you? Have a yeah. quick look at something. I'll explain. Look at the the tip of the missile. You see the the black part. You see how there's a hole cut into the side of it right there. Yep. That was done so that we could have this as a museum. This glass part was mandated in here by some things that we had to work out with the, with the Soviets to let us have this as a museum. That hole was cut and this glass was installed here so the Soviets could fly their satellites over here 
look down to make sure that we weren't sneaking a warhead in this thing, that we might someday think like, oh, well, we can retrofit it and make it go again. That's impossible. This thing will never go anywhere. Really? Yeah. And we that... had to block the door so that it could never, uh, when we walk back around, you'll see these three big concrete blocks that they placed. So the door can never be opened any further than it is right now. So this viewing port, as lovely it is for visitors to come and have a bird's eye view of, of the missile in the silo, actually has a completely different purpose, really. Yep. My goodness. Yeah, this is all, there's nothing, this is not original, obviously, the glass, but all of this is just exactly the way it was. So, in the history of the program, they've had a couple of accidents. The, the most notable one was... Um, in 1980, Damascus, Arkansas, one of the sites, maintenance guys were working on the missile. They were where we were down on level two, mm -hmm. where we first saw the missile, where you saw those maintenance platforms there. Guys were working there, it had an eight pound socket that they were working on a component there on the side of the missile. It was supposed to be lanyarded to your body. It, for some reason, it wasn't. The guy dropped it and it went doink, 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 all the way down to where just above where we were standing down there on level seven and poked a hole in the side of the missile into the fuel tank of the, the first stage. The fuel started to leak out. Leak out was a, nobody knew what to do. They had never even planned for something like this. Uh, the missile did not immediately blow up. It took a while for enough of the vapors to concentrate. Uh, there's some speculation as to what actually caused the explosion uh, a fan being turned on, something sparked, ignited those vapors. When that happened, it ruptured the rest of the missile. Thousands of gallons of fuel and oxidizer came into contact with each other, blew this 760-ton steel silo door up like the top of a can, 250 yards off to the side, blew the top of the missile out of the silo, off, warhead, quarter of a mile away, yeah, that was a that was a big bang. <laughs> and Warhead was fine, I suppose. Warhead was fine. Warhead would not have detonated. It take it took them a day and a half to find it because nobody knew what it looked like. <laughs> oh, of course, because it's you know it's the only people that would have seen it would have been the, cr the maintenance crews and oh even the assemblers. The assemblers. assemblers. Yeah, because uh, of the because the thing that the, we look at on the top, the cone is not. That's just sealing it all up. And because exactly. we've got the little so window keep, in so, this one. So keep in mind. So re-entry vehicle is already loaded with the warhead. The maintenance yeah. guys are never going to get inside that thing to see what the actual warhead looked like. They had the guy get bring guys in from Langley to identify it. And uh, said, "Yep, there it is. It's laying right by the road, right there." You see, I'm 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 making the classic mistake there, thinking. The missile stays in one piece. It doesn't. It's going to jet so, start jettisoning it. First stage, um, second stage, re-entry vehicle. And then the re-entry vehicle, which you have over there, there on the truck, right. will then... No, it's the, an ablative cone. So yeah, the right. Cone burns away. Yeah. And then the warhead itself continues on right. its, so its merry way. It's either uh, pre-programmed to, uh, to be... So there's two different ways that it can go off. An air burst, 10,000 feet above the ground, the bomb is going to detonate. That's going to do the most widespread devastation, 900 square miles of total destruction. Ground burst would be used if they were trying to take out what was underneath the Kremlin, the, the bunker underneath the Kremlin, or maybe another missile silo, although keep in mind, we were never gonna do these as a first, we weren't gonna aim these at their, at yeah. their silos because chances are those missiles weren't even gonna be there. They yeah. were gonna be headed at us. So it's you're you're looking for maximum devastation with these sort of weapons as opposed to precision strike aimed at the civilian and population centers to to just annihilate the 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 viability of the soviet union to continue on as a country mutually assured destruction exactly yeah. Ooh, that wind boy it's not a pleasant day today so most of this equipment that you see here right now was was involved in what they the propellant transfer. So none of this equipment would have been here just when the silo was active on alert. There were times that they would have to take the fuel and oxidizer out of the missile. 
around those time limit maintenance checks that we talked yep. about. They would have to get in there, look at gaskets, valves and stuff. So all of this equipment was paramount in getting the fuel out of the missile, keeping it stored. Remember, 60 degrees, that yep. stuff had to be kept. So we had holding trailers, conditioning trailers that uh, as the, the fuel came out, it was kept at the same temperature. So a lot of, a lot of uh, work went on when they were doing that as well. It's such an innocuous place. It's not quite the middle of nowhere, but it's next door to it. And it just sort of blends quite into, yeah. into the background, which I suppose is the point. But it's, once you get, you know, having come up from down there, it's remarkable how much is there when yes, we sort of, yeah, as, as we wander back to the museum. With, without all of this stuff and without the visitor center, it, yeah, it, it would be uh, something you would, uh, you know, chances of you knowing or walking up on this and knowing what exactly was down there <laughs> might not be uh, uh, apparent. So you'd, you'd essentially see, if you'd stumbled across it, a bunch of radio, radio towers, a big steel cover, and, yeah, maybe it was a pumping a, station or yeah. something like that, water storage or something of that effect. The Titan Missile Museum, as you can hear from my voice throughout the tour, is awe-inspiring in the truest and also the darkest sense of the term. Standing at the bottom of the silo looking up at N10 was a very profound and very odd experience. Rocketry and spaceflight is a fascination of mine, but we have to remember that our initial steps into space were on converted missiles designed to carry the most destructive weapons ever devised. As Mike showed us superbly on the tour, the Titan II sites and the Minuteman III sites that are currently out there were on alert for a call that the world hope and hopes never comes. From an engineering standpoint, the complex and the ICBM that it holds are staggering, and the context within which they are placed is pitched perfectly by Mike and his team there in Green Valley. It really was an experience that will stay with Wendy and myself for a long time. The Titan Missile Museum is on the National Historic Landmark Register in the US, and of course is part of the wider Arizona Aerospace Foundation. You can check out more about the Titan Missile Museum via the links to the website below and their social media accounts that are all in the description for this episode. Do check them out because the Titan Missile Museum sites, especially their Instagram, has some fantastic images and videos that really help you place the tour that we went on in a better context than my admittedly poor attempts to describe it as we went round in the show. Once again, we just have to thank Mike Riggs so much for his time for showing us around and under the Titan Missile Museum. So be sure to check out the links to them and the sister site over at Pima, of course, because it's through Pima that this visit was made possible. So thanks to Scott Marchand and his team as well. Your support for the podcast continues to blow me away, and the kind reviews people have been leaving on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere have been really touching. Thank you to all who've reviewed the show, as that is a great way of helping it get higher up those weird recommendation algorithms so that new people can find us. If you haven't yet, all you have to do is pop a number of stars that you think the show is worth, into your podcast app of choice, and you'll forever have my thanks. However many stars you may wish to give me. The more the merrier, the fewer the harder I'll work to make the show better. Of course, if you want to hear the episodes early, you can join us on Patreon, where I'm slowly adding pictures from the trip as well, and that all starts from just £3 a month plus VAT. But I know times are tough, those star reviews are a lot cheaper and probably more helpful in the long run. So please do not feel pressured into signing up. But, you know, don't forget those reviews in your apps. You don't need a postcard signed from me. Well, you can if you want. Next week, we will be looking at the women behind the few with Dr. Sarah Louise Miller. So be sure to subscribe to not miss that one out because it is going to be a treat. Sarah's book, The Women Behind the Few, is superb and it will be out next week as well. Until then, thank you for all your support and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.